everybody. Welcome to this special interview episode of Thinking Outside the Long Box. Today, you know, we all remember the poo potatoes, but today we have someone very special with us, and that is Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, which of course brought us the movie and uh, several other books, including his new one coming out called, uh, is it The Hail Mary or just Hail Mary? It's uh, Project Hail Mary. Project Hail Mary. Sorry, I, I left a, I knew I was leaving a word out somewhere in there. <laughs> it's all good. But, uh, Andy, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I, I'm doing, I'm doing really well. We got snowed in yesterday, so I spent a good day cleaning my office. <laughs> oh, where are you? Uh, in Colorado. It snowed, okay. snowed about a foot here in Denver. They got like two and a half or something like that. So it's <laughs> pretty crazy. So Obviously, the first question I got to ask is, you know, when the film The Martian came out and the book The Martian came out, you know, the, the comments from people revolved around how scientifically accurate your writing was. And when we read your bio, you know, it says you're a software engineer and that this was a hobby. Like, how does like space travel slash engineering as a hobby translate into scientists going, that's really accurate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I think, uh, I think everybody's pretty knowledgeable about their hobby, right? If, uh, if you're like a total gearhead and you're like way into cars and you write a story about a bunch of mechanics doing cool stuff, and then other, and then real world mechanics say, Hey, that's pretty accurate. You know, nobody's going to be really surprised, right? Right. <laughs> so it's just, this happens to be the thing that I'm interested in and passionate about. And so that's, that's what I wrote about, <laughs> right? So, what you know. So, you know, as you're, as you're spending time, you have, you have these three novels that all revolve heavily around space travel, like, uh, you know, lunar landing, Martian landing, things like that. What excites you the most about what we're seeing coming out of like NASA and like Elon Musk and, you know, those guys and their kind of like rocketry experiments? Like what, what's exciting you the most about that world right now? Um, well, I, I still, I, the, the sad, the sad news is kind of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I really love the uh, privatization of space travel. I love, um, I love watching SpaceX drive the price of launches down and down and down. Um, uh, so I love that because I think uh, reducing the cost of getting mass into low Earth orbit is the key to a, a truly like commercial space flight industry. So I think that's a big deal. Um, but uh, really what I wish people were working on is uh, artificial gravity. I wish that people were working on s centrifuges in space. Just all you have to do is spin, that's it, and you've got your artificial gravity. But I think that's going to ultimately be an absolutely necessary step to any long-term space missions. Humans just don't do well in zero G for long periods of time. Astronauts on ISS come back from, you know, being in space for a year or something, they can barely walk. I mean, they need right. to be carted off in, in wheelchairs. And so you try to imagine if we're going to send people to Mars after spending eight months in, in zero G, they're going to suddenly be, even in one Martian gravity, they're going to be like, uh, you know, <laughs> right. so we need a centrifuge. We, we need, and also there's just so many physiological problems that happen uh, to humans in space from, uh, well, there's lots of minor problems, uh, but the worst is ocular degeneration, which is permanent problems to sight oh. that do not, that most of it, like, you know, your bone density goes down, your heart gets weaker. There's a bunch of issues that happen when you're in space, but they all recover when you get back into gravity. Your, your heart gets stronger again, your bones get thicker again, but the damage to your eyes is permanent. Huh. That's you know, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's because basically um, in your heart doesn't pump as hard because it doesn't have to to get blood around the body. So your eyes, your retinas don't get as much blood as they should. So some of the cells die. And once they're dead, they're dead, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I really think that we should be working on a centrifuge 
so you know i've seen i've seen tons of like you know articles about you know like a space elevator where like there's a geosynchronous like you know space station and things like that you know and and things about centrifuges and maintaining gravity and like you're saying it's like super super important do you think that like the effects of like even like is there any research i guess that you know about of of um created gravity working differently on our body than standard gravity um well i mean they've done it the the, the biggest issue is tidal forces so what that means is um so what, by the way when you're talking about a space elevator a space elevator does use centripetal force for a part of its construction but that's not artificial gravity that i'm talking about i'm just talking about like um, the G forces you feel from being right, in a room in that's space spinning. Station. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where it's, it's like the, you know, or it could be, it could be two things tethered by thin wires as long as they're spinning around at the right rate. Oh, that's cool. The biggest issue is, uh, like I said, G forces, uh, sorry, tidal forces. So for instance, if you're, um, if you're in a centrifuge and the radius is not very big, like let's say you're in a, in a, you're in a room that's on the that's like on the end of a 20 meter pole and it's spinning around fast enough to provide you with one g of force outward okay okay well the problem is while your feet are experiencing one g of force your head is not experiencing that much and as much the closer you get to the center of the centrifuge the less um, okay. force it'll be. And so the difference in force between your head and your feet can really cause a lot of problems for humans, not physiological problems, but balance issues and coordination and stuff. Other things that can really mess with you are, um, you know, if I throw something to you, it'll go like that. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <It'll go. laughs> so those are kind of neat but um but it, it can be very if you're trying to actually get work done <laughs> yeah it can be extremely disconcerting and and uh problematic so they've they've often said that the best way to do a centrifuge is you need about a hundred meters i think is what it works out to be about a hundred meters of radius okay and then and then the uh, centrifuge the, you would the the distance over two meters say if you're a two meter tall human the force difference at your head and your feet will be close enough you know the the forces will be close enough that you won't really notice and won't really be a problem oh that's that's awesome like so this is what's fascinating to me like i know like this much stuff about like conan the barbarian or like collecting vhs tapes but <laughs> this is my daughter she makes an appearance pretty much every video this is hello daughter video. He, he wrote The Martian. Hi. Go <laughs> okay, have fun in the snow, bud. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, like I know a ton of stuff about my thing. You know, you're, you know a ton of stuff about your thing. And one of the things that I think is really, really interesting. Okay, I'm mad at Conan the Marbarian because you can't make a sword that way. <laughs> you you really can't, can't make a sword by <laughs> pouring it into a mold. That's not how it works. The entire ethos is invalid. <laughs> it, it has always really bugged me that that's how they make the sword in the movie. Just so you know. <laughs> no, that's not how that works. I'm not even a medieval blacksmithery nerd. I, but I know that. Come on. So and they, so, then they did the same damn thing with Valerian Steel and Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Valerian Steel is kind of magic, so it makes So who knows? Really that might be how that. that works. I doubt yeah. it, though. I feel like Steel is Steel. but Steel is Steel. <laughs> and in Conan, it was just Steel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was the whole point. The riddle, the riddle of steel is, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> my wife, hang on, I have to text my wife. My wife just said, is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm joking about being angry, not actually angry. <laughs> Oh, man. If my wife texted me every time she heard me yell, I would be on the phone constantly. <laughs> so, so with you having... Like, I was worried. She's like, is everything okay? <laughs> with you having a ton of knowledge about, like, space and spaceships and, like, you know, the, the physics of it and the engineering of it and things like that, I noticed that you tend to really only talk about humans in space. Do you ever, like, think to yourself or, like, postulate what it would be like to encounter a species that doesn't 
need gravity or that needs more gravity or that travels in a different way than we conceptualize like do you ever find yourself going into like the truly fantastical sure um perhaps you should uh read my latest book project hail mary that, that was the building to it <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there is uh, extraterrestrial life in Project Hail Mary. It's sort of a mold that infests our that infects our sun, causing um, well, it'll it will ultimately it's like an algae bloom on the sun, okay. and it will ultimately consume enough um, of the solar output um, that life on Earth won't be sustainable anymore, and so they have to find a, a solution. That's kind of one of the core plots. So when we look when we look at your your latest book, Project Hail Mary, here's this guy that wakes up very far away from Earth with two corpses next to him, and he has no idea what's happening. Uh, total amnesia. Doesn't so, know his name. So how do you like I guess when you get to that point, like where do you build from there and what, what directions are you taking like this idea in? Well, um, I basically, the, how do I put it? This was the, this amnesia approach was the solution to a problem I was having. Um, the problem is, um, so the plot of the story is, like I said, there's this, there's this alien, like, single-celled microbe that's reproducing out of control on our sun. They figure out that it's, you know, it it basically infects stars and then spores out to other stars. It's not intelligent life or anything like that. It's just it's mold. It's just life, yeah. <laughs> it's just life, and it and it um and it spores out from star to star. And then they realize that um, oh, okay. Uh, all the stars in our neighborhood of the galaxy are having are dimming and so they realize oh they're all infected with astrophage too they call it astrophage because it means astrophage is greek for a thing that eats stars <laughs> nice <laughs> a star eater and um although that doesn't consume the star it just lives on it in the same way algae lives in the ocean um but um it 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 uh, they realize that all the stars in our area are infected with astrophage except Tau Ceti. And they can't figure out what's special about Tau Ceti. Why is Tau Ceti not having a problem? And so they decide they're going to send a space mission there um, to find out if anything they can about what's special about Tau Ceti. And that's kind of their last ditch effort on saving earth that's why the ship is called the hail mary <laughs> like the football pass and the um and, and they don't know what they'll find and they sent three people and they had to put them in comas to uh to survive the trip and uh, only one of them survived the coma <laughs> <laughs> and now the problem i had is if i told the story linearly um it would be just a bunch of setup for the problem as they discover things, a slow run up to eventually the Hail Mary gets launched and then off it goes. And then you would never see any of those characters again for the rest of the book. Right. And I'm like, well, that's weird and unsatisfying. And then also it would be boring. The first third of the book would all just kind of be exposition where nothing that interesting is happening and stuff like that. Whereas doing it with a flashback approach means I can just skim over all of that. And I can just have, just here are the salient points of what happened in the past that led to this mission. That way I can start the story in media res and like, here's the interesting stuff. And here is the interesting parts of the stuff that led to it. And I don't have to do a bunch of intermediate bullshit. That's awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially when it comes to like the structure of the book. Cause... Yeah. And also I'm a huge hypocrite, just FYI. I, I, I hate flashbacks and I'll be the first person to tell you that flashbacks are a lazy, lame ass uh, <laughs> storytelling medium that no one should ever do. And then half of this book is flashback. So what I hate about flashbacks, what really bugs me about them is um, oftentimes I'll be really into a story. Ooh, this is awesome. This is awesome. This is awesome. Now we're going to have a flashback as to how this guy met his wife or whatever. And I'm like, who gives a shit? Tell me I'm, I'm interested in this story that's happening. So flashbacks are often 
make you roll your eyes because you know that the plot advancement is going to stop. You know that it's like, uh, the story will not proceed until this flashback is over. So this flashback irritates me, right? right. And um, so for me, I just want to make sure that my flashbacks are advancing the plot. You're, 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 they're advancing the plot. They're solving mysteries to, to keep the reader engaged. So hopefully right. the reader is as invested in what's going on in the flashback segments as they are in what's going on in the present. It's kind of like the it's kind of like the film Memento, where like the whole thing is built. In well, that's. I mean, yeah. no, I know, but like you know, normally a flashback is just telling you know X part of you know the backstory, whereas this yeah. is like kind of reproducing and giving you new information that moves the plot forward. I think of it a bit as almost like the flashback mechanism they had in Lost. Oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense too. In in Lost, you would there would be basically each episode would have like the flashback sequences would have their own story going on that ties into the current episode. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. So <laughs> when, when you envision like what the world, you know, the worlds that you're creating look like, you have a, a very like, I guess like evocative way of writing that like really brings to mind like the visual like aesthetic in in my mind when I'm reading your books. Great. So Thanks. when you saw it translated in The Martian, like how did you feel about like, you know, did it look the way you thought it was going to look? I'm always really curious about that. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I mean, they did such a fantastic job, but it didn't look like the way things looked in my mind. Huh. Um for starters, uh, in, in, in the book, uh, I, I designed the whole Mars mission, the whole Ares mission profile and stuff. And um, uh, Hermes, the Hermes was not this huge, complicated ship like you saw. The mm -hmm. Hermes was just basically like a giant cone. Oh, okay. Because the whole ship did arrow breaking at Mars and Earth mm -hmm. as needed. Um, so the entire ship, so it, it was a cone that could, in flight mode, separate out these two halves, leaving the center spindle alone, right. and then spin them to provide a centrifuge, because I think that's important for space travel, <laughs> and then have an ion engine directing thrust across or along the main axis. And so that's what it would do. And when it came time to aero break, it would collapse back together again, and there was a, there was a heat shield that was a single solid unit. that, it, it, And so that's how I imagined Hermes. Hermes was cramped. I mean, it was, it was big enough that the astronauts weren't at each other's throats, but it wasn't this vast, spacious, you know, thing as seen in this. <laughs> also the hab, I, I, the, the hab that Mark was in was like, um, in the book, it was something like six meters in radius or yeah. something. It was like a, a circle of six meter radius. So it's like 12 meters across. So it's like, well, what's that like 30 feet circle yeah, and that's it not very that's big. it there were not multiple she's back <laughs> i think she's good are you still going out yeah right. i have to wear sophia's snow pants because um you got everything else wet yeah and i can't find the pants i was wearing yesterday all right well have fun i love you <laughs> i don't have shoes on yet oh well okay <laughs> sorry do you still love her even though she doesn't have shoes on Ooh, that's a stretch i think <laughs> <laughs> I have three pairs of socks on, so. <laughs> that won't do well in the snow, but good luck. Yeah, it'll help once she puts you'll, her boots on. <laughs> you'll, need, you'll need shoes. <laughs> <laughs> he knows a lot about smart stuff, so you should listen to him when it comes to shoes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure ah, don't apologize. Very cute. You destroyed your train of thought. But so when, you know, when you when you're when you're writing your books you know you're creating like this this new world these new environments these new places for people to be in you know you seem to see it mentally in the same way i would see it like something more like dark star or alien or like <laughs> yeah everything, a little everything is like cramped and like you know because a spaceship you're i feel like you're going for function over like comfort a lot oh yeah for sure. Because shooting that, something into space is pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. But when it comes down to it, I mean, uh, movies are all about visuals. So they needed right. to have a visual aesthetic that works. And cramped conditions are fun for a bit in movies. But for the most part, 
you need to be able to have the um, you need larger sets so that you can have the performers be in you know here and there and not all in the same shot and transitioning across the room as they do this that, and the other thing. There's a lot of stuff that directors really need to do their magic, and it all requires a certain amount of space. Right. So going going back to Project Hail Mary, uh, I see that you're doing a, a little book tour coming up in May. Uh, Virtual, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what what is kind of the the um, I guess the process of doing a virtual book tour. Like, obviously I've seen authors in stores and stuff like that, but like, how, how do you go about doing that? Um, it's all just going to be, you know, online zooms and stuff. And people, uh, it, it depends. E each host has their, e each host has their own way of doing things. So it's like, Oh, here's one for Barnes and Noble. Well, they'll, they'll give me a, a link to either a zoom or some proprietary thing or whatever. And I'll be there and, People will log in or people will just be like observing and maybe they can put questions in the chat. And I don't know. It's a, you know, we're in a brave new world here, but uh, <laughs> we'll get it done. Not as cool as a real book tour, but a lot better than having a super spreader event. Exactly. It's, it, <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting. Like, so I, <laughs> this, this all going to sound like crazy talk for like two seconds. So I just finished reading Ted Kaczynski's manifesto about like technology and industry kind of like ruining the world. And he uh, made a lot of good points and now you're going to start blowing things up. Well, I'm not going to blow anything up, but like he did make a lot of sense. <laughs> but like when, when we look at like how much like technology has like kind of come into our lives and is like kind of molding and shaping the way we like interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, you know, that interplanetary travel, you know, with our ways to be able to communicate with each other, because eventually we could string, you know, relays so that communication could happen really quickly between like here in the moon or here in Mars or something. Well, you like don't that. even need relays. You can. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know there's like some lag time and things like that, but. Well, there's the speed of light is the main issue. Yeah. <laughs> no, so seriously, it's. <laughs> that's, no that's awesome so like when you think about how technology is like on earth and like our you know our ever increasing like capacity to shoot ourselves into space for less and less money like do you think that it really is a possibility that we could have like a lunar space station a mars station like and even move into the other planets absolutely um i think uh well, certainly we already have the technology and capability to make a lunar station or a Mars station if we wanted to. It's just prohibitively expensive. And we've found that it's, you know, for the things we want to learn about the moon or Mars, we can do with probes, hmm. right? Um, I think that there will eventually be uh, a settlement on the moon and then much later Mars. Um, and that will only happen when there's an economic reason for it. And uh, so in my book, Artemis, which is also available at bookstores, <laughs> um, uh, the, there's a, a city on the moon called Artemis, and the reason it exists is tourism. Right. And so... And that's um, kind of a... Artemis, I, I haven't had a chance to read Artemis, but that's kind of like a crime crime yeah. space novel, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the main character is a low-level criminal who gets in way over her head. But... Um, but <laughs> Yeah, I, I designed, from the ground up, I, I started this off by saying, what is humanity's first city that is not on Earth going to be like? Hmm. So it's like, I didn't even start off with the idea of the moon. I just said, a city. It has to be like a city of civilians, not some government-funded project, but it's just there because it has some economic reason to be there. Every city has an economic reason to be there. Right, exactly. Um it's there for some reason. Where is it? Is it in low Earth orbit? Is it on the moon? Is it on Mars? Is it in the asteroid belt? Where is it? Where Where is the most likely place for the very first human settlement that's not on Earth? And I decided it was the moon because the moon has raw materials. Right. To build a city in orbit, you have to bring literally every gram of mass up there with you. Um, on the moon, you can smelt local rocks and um, make aluminum. It's great. 80, 80 some odd percent of, if you pick up a rock on the surface of the moon, there's about an 85% chance that it's a mineral called anorthite. Okay. And anorthite, if you smelt it, it breaks down into aluminum and oxygen. So oh. 
it gives you aluminum to make your moon base with and oxygen to fill it. Uh, it's like, it's like God said, like, I'm going to make this easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> And yet here we all are sitting on the earth like dummies. <laughs> well, we don't quite have, but if the price to low earth orbit gets low enough, then the price to getting to the moon would get low enough. If a middle-class person could afford a once in a lifetime vacation to the moon, I think a lot of people would. Oh, sign me up. Like yeah. I, I would absolutely love to do that. I'd probably throw up on the way up there because I get motion sick really easy. But... Ah, no, no, no. The way so <laughs> I don't know if I ever fully just I came up with a lot more stuff for Artemis than actually made it into the book. But the way the thing is, like civilians are not astronauts; they're not trained. So the way that you get launched is you get basically you're put in a pod, and then you are given general anesthetic. <laughs> And or, or whatever, basically like propofol, whatever. You're you're knocked out at the lowest level of unconsciousness for the launch, right? And then you are placed by you know the employees. Then your your pod is taken and put in in your room that you're going to be on on the transfer ship, which is basically a space station in a cycler orbit. Oh, okay. And the cycler orbit just periodically goes back and forth between the moon and Earth, just through natural um, orbital mechanics. And so it's really more of a hotel. And then you're just put in the room, and it has an artificial gravity uh, because spinning. Because gravity is very important. <laughs> yeah, artificial gravity that spins. And so, from your point of view, uh, when you're going to the moon, it's like you're you're put in a pod, or you're sitting down, or you're laying down, or whatever, and you get knocked out. And when you wake up, you are in your room in a space hotel that's headed toward the moon. That's awesome. <laughs> and you're experiencing one g of gravity. Uh. Man. And it takes seven days for this cycler orbit to get to the moon. And during those seven days, they very slowly reduce the rotation rate so that you transition over seven days from one G to one sixth G inside your station, uh, inside your transfer ship. So by the time you get there, you have transitioned to one sixth G, which is lunar gravity yeah you're you're acclimating they're yep. acclimating you. that's and then it awesome. does the on the way back you do the opposite that's really cool man it's like, i thought this stuff through man <laughs> you did like and you know i think that's i think that's the thing that people really recognize about about your fiction is that you know you're not there's tons of science fiction out there that's great but has like absolutely zero basis in reality you hey know? there's no problem with that stuff like yeah. i i love that stuff in the background here you may see my tardis <laughs> I'm a huge fan. Like Doctor Who is my favorite science fiction property. And I like it, it in the universe. I like it more than Star yeah. Trek. I like it more than Star Wars. It's my the Doctor's my guy slash gal. And like <laughs> I love it. And it is the softest sci-fi ever. <laughs> it is like as far from any sort of technical accuracy as you can possibly be. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you know. The, there's kind of you know in fantasy there's grim dark and like in in science fiction there's like hard sci-fi and you know your your stuff fits in that category you love softer sci-fi too I, I like it as a consumer yeah, yeah but you would not you would never feel inclined to write something like that would you yeah it's just not my writing style yeah, that makes but sense. just because i don't write a certain thing doesn't mean i don't enjoy a certain thing oh, yeah like i love fantasy i love superhero movies i love all that stuff i'm a, I'm a nerd right right yeah i know i know <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am a nerd, but um, my 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 skill is in writing hard sci-fi. For me, what's important in science fiction, and actually kind of anything, but really let's start with science fiction, is um, you can break whatever physics you want. I don't care. You take the laws of physics, run them through a meat grinder, and completely ignore them. You do whatever you want. You just got to be consistent. Right. So if you're if you're inconsistent or irrational in how the usage of these of of MacGuffin tech works, that's when I get mad. So like uh, to give an example, Star Trek, love Star Trek. Warp drive, okay, they can go many times the speed of light. No problem, I got no problem with that. Completely physically impossible, I got no problem with that. Okay, so then goes uh, I think I think warp eight, which is the maximum speed of the uh, of the original series Enterprise, right. um, is something like 
you know, it's over a hundred times the speed of light. It's right. it's something very large, maybe even more. I'm not sure. Because it's like um, an exponential east. It's an exponential thing, but it's not something convenient. It's not like two to the n. It's right. <laughs> it's it's some whatever, but it's well over a hundred times the speed of light. So I got no problem with that. Warp one, I think, is the speed of light. I think so. Yeah. I think warp one is c, and um, yeah. So anyway. Um, so there's one episode where, you know, we, we've seen all this before, you know, whatever. There's one episode in Classic Trek where they need to go from Mercury to Earth. And it, like, takes them a while. I'm like, just, just go dude, Mercury is, like, seven late minutes from <laughs> Earth. Like. <laughs> and on, like, the lowest speed. Maybe there. That would be at warp one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe there's a speed limit in the system. Yeah, I don't know, but Possibly, whatever. Yeah. Still. <laughs> So it's like, come on, come on, come on. The Federation's like, this is a school zone. You have to Exactly. <laughs> you can go no faster than warp one. Okay. Yes. yes okay. But even then, I'm it's just like. Seven minutes away. <laughs> yeah. Even then it's seven minutes away. And I think impulse power is percentage of light speed. Yeah. So when they say half impulse, that's half C and stuff like that. And right. So I'm like. <laughs> even even one tenth impulse would still be like, like you know, a couple hours. Time. Yeah, right, max. Yeah, like come on. It's like flying a plane across the country, effectively. <laughs> yeah, if yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, as we're because I'm getting up on my on my time with my uh, with my Zoom because I'm mm. cheap, and mm. <laughs> we're approaching uh, that magic forty minute mark. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. Um, tell us, you know, where we can pre-order your book, because I know it's not quite out yet, you know, and where we can find more information about you and where, you know, our, our fans can find you on social media. Well, if you go to andyweirauthor.com, uh, you can find all that information. Um, you can pre-order the book pretty much anywhere, uh, anywhere that sells books. So either the, the big retailers or, you know, maybe consider your local bookstore. Mm -hmm. Um because they could, I'm sure, use the business shortly after this pandemic, and I'm sure they'd be happy to take your order over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and uh, what was the other question? Oh, just like your socials, but if it's oh, all my socials are, uh, uh, yeah, my socials are uh, my my Twitter is Andy Weir, and my uh, Facebook is Andy Weir Author. That's awesome. Well, Andy, or I'm sorry, those are backwards, but whatever. oh, they'll they'll figure it out. You'll There's work it out. Look for the blue check. <laughs> So Andy, thank you so much for being on the show. Like it's, it's truly, I, I guess it's awesome to me to see a hobbyist like myself that gets over obsessed with something to the point where like experts go, wow, that's a lot of knowledge. Like, <laughs> so, so thank you again for being on the show. And I look forward to finishing uh, Project Hail Mary. I got part of the way through it and then, you know, life. So <laughs> life happens, but thank you so much again for being on our show, man. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, really, oh, yeah. quick, really quick before I let you go, could I just get an ad bump from you? Just, yeah, sure. What do you need me to do? Um, this is Andy Weir, uh, writer of Project Hail Mary, uh, and you're listening to Thinking Outside the Long Box. Okay. All right, go for it. Hey, I'm Andy Weir, author. Let me start over. I want to look to camera. <laughs> hey, I'm Andy Weir, author of Project Hail Mary, and you're listening to Thinking Outside the Long Box. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. We really appreciate your time. Sorry about your thing. Sorry about last week. I was I thought I was dying. So <laughs> Oh, what'd you get? Like uh, sick? Yeah, my whole house got like some kind of sinus crap. So we just went down for well, a few days. <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah, not COVID. <laughs> not COVID. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy. We really appreciate your time, man. All right. Thanks for having me. Bye. Have a good one.